Hey community, this episode was so good and so long, we're going to split this bitch into two. So here is part one of our episode with Craig Seymour. Hey community, it's your boy Craig Seymour. You might know me from the social media, from the Twitter. You might know my books like Biography of Luther Vandross. And what's brewing today? Craig Seymour, music critic. Met Gala 2023. And ask your aunties, lovers and friends. So get your cups ready for a minority report. Sade! Hey. <laughs> Hey, hey, welcome to Minority Report. It's Auntie Carell. It's Auntie Dewan. And it's Auntie Jarrell. Hey, y'all. Ooh, and community. Oh, we've had some awesome guests lately, by the way. <laughs> and this is another one on the list. And I'm already giddy. <laughs> and the ladies are already making fun of me. It is what it is. But <laughs> we have, and actually, before we say his name, his government name, we're going to ask you, what is your auntie name? Okay, I'm my auntie Zero Sugar with S U G A H because not, I mean I like to drink, but that's usually my mixer, like a nice you know Coke Zero, Sprite Zero, you know the whole Zero family. So just call the me the whole Zero family, Zero the house Sugar. Is zero. The house is Zero. <laughs> She's entering her Zero era. Right. Right. <laughs> that's really when so you don't have any. To give, right? And <laughs> no, zero. You got zero. It. None. You got a lot to give because like I was I was teasing him before we, we hopped on. He has 15 job. Mm -hmm. He's had many a life. Like, so I'm excited just to hop on in it. So this is Craig Seymour. The hey, author, the philanthropist, the activist, the the author, the the the, the ex stripper, the like. I mean, <laughs> look. Now that we ain't even started the interview, and you're gonna be okay. That's fine. I'm just saying, you don't have me in life, so I'm excited. No it. shame in my game. Ask what. None. She should not have said nothing was off limits. <laughs> you didn't get my publicist and send y'all the list of questions. Right. <laughs> right. I do nope. not see this in my The fax is broken. Uh... The fax is broken. The fax machine <laughs> is not processing. <laughs> Put my phone. No. But but you might know Craig just from his his couple books, honestly. Uh the Luther Van Dross, that autobiography, the Luther, what is it? Luther Life Long and the Longing of Luther Long. Van Dross. Um, which I like that title, by the way. Thank and then you. also the All I Could Bear, My Life in Strip Clubs of Gay DC. So that's where that what's stripper up? comic come from. DMV, yeah. what's good? <laughs> <laughs> Do you still live in DC? No. Um, okay. I haven't lived in DC for, like, I think I left DC like at the very end of the 90s. So okay. I'm in Miami okay. Beach now, but I've bounced okay. around. I've, been, I've done Atlanta. I've done New York. I've done um, Chicago. Did Buffalo for a hot minute. So, you know. I, 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 was gonna get, say, I get a How'd you get to Buffalo after all those places? You said not <laughs> Atlanta, Chicago, New York, Buffalo. You know what it was? It was, um, okay, so like I was an editor of Vibe magazine, right? And like that was on, what Khadija. I thought. <laughs> Khadija James. <laughs> Flavor Junior, right? So I was an, not the editor. I was an editor, let's be very clear, at Vibe. <laughs> And you know, that had been so aspirational. Like that's what I had wanted to do. But then when I got there and it was, you know, most of my job would, I would be able to write things here and there. And some things were very great, like my Janet Jackson cover story and stuff like that. But that it was like most of my energy was into finding other writers and working with other writers to do their craft, which was fantastic. And I loved it. Like I would always like, when I get clips, I see if somebody like went to an HBCU or something like, I mean, I really found writers and nurture writers because I think that's very important to nurture the next generation of black writers. But something deep down inside said, like, I still wanted to kind of write a lot, you know, like I wanted, mm -hmm. it just was kind of a, I didn't realize that necessarily before, but it was just kind of a realization that what my purpose is, because everything about purpose, you know, what my purpose is, is to, Right. And so that said, there was a job as a pop music critic 
um, at the Buffalo News. And I was like, you know, so I sent my little papers in. This is back in the day, you send a little hard copy resume, make you a few copies of the Kinkos, put in a manila envelope, and you're good, you know? And maybe you get a call, maybe you don't. So I, they called me and they were interested. And so then I was really like, oh, this is a, even though nobody knew it, nobody was thinking about it like that, except this was what I had in my mind. I knew it was a very big deal for a black gay man to be the main pop music critic at, in a major city. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. like I said, like nobody, it wasn't like Twitter, people weren't like, nobody knew, nobody thought that, but I knew it in my mind. And so I yeah. did it for that reason, because I was very much like, you know, because I really didn't have a whole lot of people that I could look to like that. I mean, all of the sort of major pop music critics and the editors and stuff were all white and, you know, all like straight white men. So I did that. But thank God, because, you know, I don't really like, I mean, obviously I'm in Miami Beach now, so obviously I don't really like the snow. So get this. So like, I got that job because, you know, Buffalo can just wear you out with the weather. But I got that job in like May or in like April, May. So it was nice spring weather, you know, look around. <laughs> you said, maybe, oh, this is nice. Maybe this you have a little nice. fall. You know, maybe you have a little coat for the nighttime. You know, you never know. You don't want to catch a chill. But like, you know, in general, it was a nice sort of situation. And then I was there throughout the whole summer. Lovely. So like, just out of the blue, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution reached out and said they had a pop music critic position open. And I was like, well, Atlanta is the new Motown. Like, that's where all the black music yeah. is popular. I can't say no to that. Like, I'm gone, you know. And mm -hmm. so uh, I was like, y'all, I know I just got here. I know I just unpacked my bag that you paid Look. to have packed to move. <laughs> <laughs> she she said, said, it all the way down to Atlanta. Look, <laughs> she like, said, winter is coming and I am going. <laughs> and do you know Period. that I was only there, like, my last day, I think, at the newspaper was, like, in the very early November. And Sha, I'm walking to my car, and the it's not normal snow. It's like aggressive, like somebody's <laughs> really just trying, like a demon in the skies is really trying to mess with you. I mean, there's like big wet clumps just hitting you in the Ooh. face, hearing coat all wet. I was like, Sha, I was so glad I'm getting up out of here. I was like, thank you, you know. Yeah, we're all originally from Lord. the Midwest, so we know that feeling. Okay, <laughs> so I was like, Love. yo. <laughs> Don't miss it one bit at all, honey. A word at all. They can keep it. I could never see snow. snow for the rest of my global life. warming. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I could never see snow for the rest of my life, and I would be Gucci. Uh, so you not miss it around Christmas though, Dewan? No, you miss it? hell to the no. Mm. Oh damn. Okay. I mean, it's you cute. Find, you could just turn on some. I'm not TV, saying some TV and watch some snow or something like that. It's you know. cute. But why? Put on like um, Home Alone. See it snowing. It ain't no different if you're looking at the TV and it's snowing. That's no different than looking out your window. And, like you look all I you're looking it. at something. So look, yeah. snow is only turn cute. the TV off. The snow is gone. Snow, <laughs> snow is only cute when it's freshly fallen. Anytime after that, especially in New York City. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's so nasty. Yeah, it, that's yeah. Boo boo and pee pee. That's all you see. Boo boo and pee pee. <laughs> yellow uh, snow. Watch the yellow snow. Uh, uh. Oh my lord, that is funny. Well, we kind of hinted at it from you being from DC. So, were you born and raised there, and then finally moved? Right. Yes, I was born in okay. Southeast DC. Um, okay. Small little hospital at the time when it was you know like an all black neighborhood, um, and then all my family, like my. Um, on my mother's side, my granddaddy, he migrated from Virgin Kilmonic, Virginia to DC during the war. And so did my grandmother, who is from Wilson, North Carolina. So, okay. you know, I'm from people that moved to DC because in World War II, they were at, you could actually get, you didn't get paid much and whatever, but you could, they were hiring black right. people. So, you know, they kind of went up for that opportunity. Um, so, yeah, so that's my story. I mean, a lot of people think, I don't know, I guess it's like some, I don't know, a lot of people just think that I'm from like a just part of DC, like a moneyed part, because there is that like a very kind of upwardly, you know, upper mm -hmm. middle class Excellent. black community mm -hmm. in DC. But I didn't know any of those people. I didn't know what Jack and Jill was. So I was like <laughs> about to graduate high school. Like I didn't know any of that. So it, it's just I didn't know these people know? existed. I didn't. Like I, it just tripped me out. Like it just tripped me out. Like, wow, you have money like that? Like, it was just mm -hmm. crazy. And then, and also just kind of like, 
what always struck me and which would I never um, like, I think one time, I don't know, some kind of family trip, I ended up in Martha's Vineyard and I just couldn't, ha- couldn't take it because just the sort of um, looking down on other forms of black culture and of other black people. I felt like that from mm. black people with money just really shocked me because I had never really experienced yeah. that kind, that level of sort of like, black respectability politics and, you know, self-hatred, whatever it is, what it is. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that was a whole, that was, you know, just like they said, you know, every skin folk and kin folk. I mean, that was a whole life lesson in that, you know? I believe mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. And so then growing up, were you always a pop culture aficionado? Like, were you like, oh, I love the music. I love all that. Or is that something as you grew that you came to love? Well, um, you know, I mean, I think just in part, I mean, music growing up in the 70s and stuff, because I was born in 1968, uh, 68, let me pronounce, I, when I used to take theater classes in um, at Howard University Children's Theater, you know, it was like these old Negroes straight up and down people that just were real, like, no, you know, say your T's and do your, and they would always, he would always like just get so exasperated about how I spoke because I always spoke with it, you know, and I run things together and everything like that. And I remember one time in the script, um, it said something like, go get something from the kitchen. And I was like, go get it from the kitchen. And he was like, Craig, the word is get. And I'm like, yeah, go get it from the And I mean, he went through, like, and I just couldn't even hear it with my ears. Like, it just didn't, I didn't see the difference. But anyway, um, so you were saying like, okay, so what I was trying to say that in is like just the black culture of the day, I think was thoroughly infused with music. And one thing about DC was a great city in that it had like WHUR, which is, well, still does, but which is the Howard University radio station. And they were very committed to like music from the whole diaspora. You know, there was like a Caribbean corner and then um, Melvin Lindsay, black gay man, would do the quiet storm at night. So I got this whole Quiet. education. Quiet yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. You got to get that base, that extra base in there. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that was kind of the context, right? <laughs> Moments in love. Oh, it's so classic. And it's like everybody knows that feeling that the Quiet Storm gives them. Exactly. Like, it's insanity. So I came up with that. But then I also had, like, my mother had very specific taste like she liked jazz and like Nina Simone and stuff like that so a lot of stuff I was listening to when I was young and didn't even know that like wow those some really sophisticated stuff but I only saw that kind of in retrospect but my personal story there's family lore that I was really into the Sly and the Family Stone's greatest hits album and that was the first thing I was into I don't remember that in the same way I've been told that my first concert was the Jackson 5 I don't remember that but oh, damn, you don't remember the Jackson I don't, Five? I don't. I don't. Wow. I, I was literally probably like four or five, like really okay. just even pre yeah. whatever. But right. I know the first my musical awakening when it was just like it's on. This has opened up everything inside of me about how music can speak to life and show you kind of a world outside of your own and just imagination was just the first time I ever heard Shaka Khan's voice, and it was with you, you know when Tell Me Something Good was in was mm. was on the radio and i'm yeah. thinking you know there's that deep part and then she sings i'm thinking rufus yeah. and shaka khan is two different people i'm thinking it's, <laughs> i'm thinking it's giving peaches and herb or right, um, right. or like <laughs> ashford and simpson type c so i'm like so then when i saw them on soul train like a few weeks later i was like oh okay it's this woman and this is band. and so then after that like i mean i immediately got the album i've always been like a deep album cut guy and just that just sort of that just birthed it yeah, all in you. You know, that's why I, I kind of put it all on Shaka, you know. I mean, that's not a bad person to put it on. <laughs> it really isn't though. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. And then so you listen to the Shaka. And then next thing you know, you just happen to stumble into a strip club for the first time. <laughs> There were a few steps in between there. Okay, what was a few steps before the strip club? <laughs> well, I had to graduate from elementary school. Then you know, yeah. Yeah. No, we don't want that. We don't want that story. Yeah. No, mm-hmm. no, basically what it was. You know what it was? It's so like when I was, um, I came out around twenty-one or something like that, and this was the time when <clears throat> in DC, like 
you know, there was like a continuum of club, like the, the strip club wasn't necessarily different from them. The dance club, it's like people would club hop, you would go to this and that. So it was really like not, now everything's so se separate and the strip club audience is one, but it was just much more fluid. So the first gay bar I ever went to was a um, strip club. And, uh, okay. you know, just the sense of freedom that I got there that I had never felt before, just being able to like look at a guy and not, you know, having to quickly like look away or like put my head down or, oh, what is this person going to do? But just being free, like, okay, you know, dang, you know, <laughs> I see what you're working with. Because it was completely new. This is not. Nice. It was completely new back then. So you were seeing everything. You were like, okay, let me turn around. I bet you know, their underwear so were crusty when you had to pull them off at the end of the night. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, oh, ah. So Crack. anyway, that kind of started my whole, like, interest in that scene and everything so in a lot of ways like my coming of age as a gay man sort of paralleled my getting further and further involved in the strip club scene because basically it, like if it wasn't a house club if it wasn't like a all black club playing house music that i was at then i was at one of the strip clubs so yeah, yeah. how did you find the courage at 21 um to start going out like, did you have a, did you have somewhat of a community at that point? Had you, you know, had you met some people and you felt like, okay, you know, like I can, you know, I can tip my, dip, dip my toe in this water a little bit <laughs> or <laughs> I was, I was dipping that's awesome, something else. No, that's, that's or did awesome you go out by yourself? Like, yeah. So this was like in the late eighties and, you know, at this point there was the whole kind of like new wave thing and all alternative song like Depeche Mode and New Order and Shirts all that kind of stuff. versus the blouses. That, you know, they, right, that kind of appeal to sort of, you know, kind of straight-ish guys and their girlfriends. So anyway, I was going to the University of Maryland College Park and Tracks, which was an all-gay club, had like an alternative night on Thursday nights. So that was just kind of the thing that people did. So it wasn't really hard to then <laughs> go on Friday nights Transition. and then, oh, Saturday. And then, Sunday, you know, so it was kind of like that. But as far as um, the strip club, I did, there was this porn star that I had my eye on. And th mm -hmm. at this time, the porn stars would like, they would be advertising them in just the regular old paper, new, um, regular old gay paper that they would be appearing at the strip club. And so one of my favorite um, um, porn stars is a, you know, these were the days it was like all white boys and everything like that, but it's power bottom Joey Stefano, Google it. And so he was at, um, he was making an appearance. And I convinced this guy, this, you know, guy that I was just recently friends with, another gay guy, to go with me. And then he ended up becoming my first boyfriend, like after that. But I didn't even really was thinking about it like that. It was just kind of like thinking of somebody, thinking of somebody to kind of like, you know how you ask, you don't want to like ask something of your real, real friends because right. they might think some kind of way, or if they say no, you might feel some kind of way. So you yeah. just ask somebody that you barely even know, <laughs> ain't no stakes. You know what I mean? Like, whatever. So, yeah. Mm. So, did you so see the porn cute. star that you was lusting over? Oh, hell yeah. Did I see? <laughs> Felt. Did I see? <laughs> <laughs> that was the... Did I see? Yeah. Yeah. Like, like vegetables at a um at a farmer's market. I was seeing a lot. <laughs> oh, this was, no, no, that was not like not right. Uh, oh, yep, no, oh, that was nice and firm. Right. And, uh... I, I was very much seeing. <laughs> and so it, no, it was so it was life changing, obviously, because I had never had sex with a guy or anything. So that was really like the first time I've ever even touched. First time I've ever feel free to kind of like openly mm. desire a guy mm. and being able to touch. It was. It's one of those things. that's just like it's burned it into my mind. World. So it's like, I always feel sort of a sense of kind of comfort and stuff when I'm in a strip club, like a gay strip club in the same way that I always feel a sense of kind of like home or something. When I hear house music or club music that I used to listen to back in the day, like it just immediately gives me that feeling of when, you know, so many people who aren't here anymore when they were around and it was just a really vibrant kind of multi-generational black gay community that has really, you know, that kind of was, decimated and has never really returned in the same kind of way you know mm, yeah. not to get real serious and bring the whole movie no, that, down but you that's know, actually but a question. Real. okay <laughs> actually before i get to that question like i was telling my husband 
that who like who our guest was and things like that and i was like yeah you know he he, he grew up in like the dc scene etc cetera, etc cetera, strip clubs blah 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 he's like oh what's his name i might have seen him <laughs> and i was like i doubt it he's like i don't know maybe because he he went he lived in new york for a number of years and then because he was born in 69 okay so he was in new york for a number of years and then he moved from new york to like dc area for a number of years so like i was just in so his mind he's like yeah the the, the gay strip scene in dc was fire like yeah like, it, was, it was it was fire. better than um sorry it was better it was like there was no other place that would we had like the fully nude and like there were, and then not even that wasn't just one joint there were like three joints like that oh, so yeah. you could be like the can it can bring them back store, <laughs> or the ass ain't assing at this place and let me go see <laughs> how it's assing over across the street or across the way and you know yeah you it was very much like that and, uh, or, and it's and, sad, like the, I feel like the last strip club there just recently closed down during I COVID. I think it closed right? like during COVID. Yeah, that was one yeah. I worked at. Not the version, excuse me, not the version that, not the place, same place that it reopened at, but um, that place. But yeah, it was okay. really like you could just, and I would get, you know, because I, I don't know, it's just my organization thing or something. But it's like, if there was one dude I liked at this club and his set was like a 20 minute set from this and that. But I didn't like that. I would run to the other club and see my other dude. <laughs> then run back to the other club. Get out my way. He goes on at 8 to 10. What you doing? A 20 <laughs> minute set at the strip club. Mm, that's a long that's time. That's a set. That's a long time. Yeah, that's what it was like when I was there. It was, it was you know, you would be just kind of, but, but you know, half the time you would just be getting felt up. Like I never danced or anything because like it was, it's easier just to like kneel down and let somebody like rub on you or whatever. Like I'm not trying to work. I'm not trying to. <laughs> Break a sweat. This is an aerobic activity. You know what I'm saying? Like somebody tried like, to. We ain't doing. You got served up in this bitch. Like no. somebody um once told me tried to teach me how to do the pole, and then they were just like, "Baby, just do you just walk around the bar?" Because I just couldn't. I don't know. Like, it, that, she said, "Just wear something nice. cute and wiggle." <laughs> <laughs> or don't wear nothing at all, girl. Just get up there. <laughs> so was your, like, I guess your infatuation or your coming out moment in the strip club, is that what led you to wanting to strip? Because you still wanted maybe that 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 feeling all the time? Um, I think it was that whole thing of, like, I don't know. I just think, like, a lot of gay development is sort of like arrested development and your awareness of certain things that may come with adolescence or something for a straight person just takes longer so i think just as that was kind of the beginning of me being able to like lust after a person openly i think the longer i was out the more i just was becoming to an awareness of myself as like a sexual figure that somebody might and then there's what that whole kind of journey you have to go on about like figuring out who you appeal to why and stuff like that so i think that was kind of my um trajectory Mm-hmm. that's interesting that and you know then it was just always weird because people because one thing about me is like a lot of people don't know that i'm black and so they like me for like reason and they don't even mm. know who i am but then the moment i open my mouth and just whatever you know <laughs> and so right, right. just having to deal with all of those like some seeing somebody's reaction like right to your face when you Oh, are you Latino or something like that? I was like, no, I'm black. I'm, I'm from down the street. They're like, where are you from? I'm like, I'm from down the street. I was born, but I'm like, you know. <laughs> They're like, oh. You're saying I'm black, like, black. A stone okay. throw away. This is, this is <laughs> what it is, you know. She's like, and catfish. Black guys, black guys. All people just <laughs> be like, okay, no longer interested. Right. And I'd have to kick my foot back, almost like they wanted to take the little dollar back that they had done oh, to wow. me. Oh, wow. <laughs> you know, it was, that's just what. You, so it's almost like the fetishization of other, but they don't know what other you are. But when you tell it, mm-hmm. they're like, "Oh, that's not the other I'm into." Exactly, mm-hmm. and I'm just one of those people. Like, I just can't. Just like I said, I could never even pronounce "get right." Like, I'm just a person that can't front. So you add, not that I would any. I mean, that's just not whatever. But right, like, right. you know, it it is what it, my friends used to really talk like that. They were like, people could be like, "Oh." um you didn't know Craig was black, and and they go, no. Like, have you ever heard him talk? Have you? <laughs> like, have you met? Him? <laughs> <laughs> Girl, <laughs> whatever. 
that's it. it, it, it and I'm sorry, I'm hogging all the questions. So go ahead, Jarrell Dewan. That's but like you had mentioned it. something about like the decimation of the community at that time as well, especially when it comes to like house music. And now it's interesting to kind of almost see in a with Beyonce really only the the revitalization of house music and the black queer culture that is associated with. What are your feelings now seeing that come back after you kind of saw maybe the birth of that and maybe the demise of it because of the HIV pand- like epidemic and now seeing maybe, okay, there's some interest still. And obviously it was still always there, mm-hmm. but now back into maybe the mainstream and, and front and center again. Well, I can say this. I think I was bamboozled again, you know, as it often happens when you write it, when, when you are writing about something that has been sidelined and kind of moved from public comp the public consciousness because like when Beyonce dropped that break my soul my emails was popping you know people, oh can you write about this oh can you and people call me on the mm. phone and everything was everything I was doing all these podcasts then the album came out I reviewed that I was on all these podcasts doing all this kind of stuff talking about it thinking that people really had a new appreciation of this form of black queer culture and that this hadn't somehow change the way people would think in the future but you know mm-hmm. come the end of the year oh it's interesting people you know oh, i haven't heard i haven't gotten this call that, and they said oh we'd love to have you as a guest again we'd love to do this we'd love mm-hmm. to do that and then you know this year's has been dry i mean this year it's <laughs> like yeah. serious cocoa yeah. butter treatment because like <laughs> <laughs> the phone just ain't ringing the emails aren't emailing and it's just it really is once again that and I'm like, well, how could I have been so foolish as to think that something was actually going to change and that they weren't just kind of dipping into the culture for a hot little minute and then mm-hmm. dipping? But once again, I did, and I really do think now it's almost like that never happened. You know, just I in terms like, of, um, I feel like every couple of years there's always like a a black square moment. You know, like with George Floyd, it was like everybody were posting their their little black square, like in solidarity of you know black unity and and Black Lives Matter and whatnot. And it was so performative and it was so like um, exploitive in a way, right? Um, and I feel like it just, we go through these cycles where, you know, bits and pieces of our culture get snapped, snatched up and gobbled up by, you know, the, you know, the powers that be, um, white community. And then all of a sudden it becomes dry again until the next thing that comes along. That's that's definitely true. And the thing that's, the thing about it that affects, you know, my bottom line and the, you know, I always try to advocate for other black queer creatives is that, you know, you can't pay your bills on the whims of when white people are going to suddenly be, or even black straight people are suddenly going to be interested in black queer culture. You know, it's like, mm, that's a word. you know, my, I always will get some emails around black music a month, um, you know, pride month, this and that, but it's just kind of like the rest of the year. Exactly. We got a, we got outside February and June, bitches. Come exactly. on now. <laughs> oh, yeah. February, February wore my ass. Like, February, I was like, next year, I need to, like, start getting into training in late January <laughs> and then take a good, I don't know, even if I just go to the country somewhere, take a little bit of break afterwards because February wore me out. But that's the thing. But then, you know, yeah. yeah. Parched. Yeah. Parched. <laughs> that's sad. That's sad to hear. And that's interesting. And maybe, maybe that's just the naiveness of myself as well. Just like someone as culturally huge as a Beyonce, after about four or five months, people are just like, eh, we're on to the next thing. Until maybe like an Ariana or an Adele or somebody come out with a house music song and then it's popping for years then after that, which sucks, you know? Yeah. And I just feel like we, as, you know, I think our losses during the AIDS crisis were in some ways because our numbers were so limited, we weren't able, so we lost a whole generation. So what I'm trying to say with that, like I don't have really people in positions of power, like editorial positions or at like a, a TV studio or a, that are black gay men that, or black queer people even that would think, oh, I want this person to do this or want this person to do that. And so, right, and I right. feel like that way and it's just all around. So it's kind of like, I try to use whatever I can do to bring up the next person and stuff. Cause I know how the industry is now. It's hard to even get that 
that mm-hmm. establishing foothold, but it's kind of like, I definitely have seen that black gay men in my position, you like, we get to a glass ceiling and you just can't get beyond that because nobody is above that, that Checking for relates it. to you, you know? So yeah. like, every, we always have to start at zero. It's like, I wrote my book on Luther, you know, white friends and stuff like that, or even like black straight friends, black straight male friends, wrote a book and then next thing though they were signing contracts with this magazine contributing writer this contributor that didn't happen for me you know so then i said oh okay maybe the music thing ain't popular let me just go straight into the memoir thing and you know write this book about the strip clubs and see if that'll pop but i think because i'm not white the white boys didn't really get into it you know they have a lot of that publishing dollar and it was just kind of like a so i was marginalized then so that again i had to start all over so it, and the same thing like with this like beyonce moment is i was kind of welcomed into all of these really great mainstream places and speaking about music in general and that this is the importance of house music within this continuum of popular music but i'm versed on all of popular music just like any other critic that's been doing it for 25 years but i don't continue to get those calls Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm not saying that in a grievance way. It's just, it's just really it's like a, a cultural document. It is what it is. This is how mm-hmm. the state of being a black gay creative in 2023. You know, damn. You know, See, I mean, I didn't mean to bring everything. Everybody, well, get I mean, up. <laughs> but I think, but I think, I think that this is this is one of the reasons why we have a podcast. Is you know, not only you know, to amplify our own unique perspectives, but to use it as a platform to introduce and share, you know, so many people like yourself that have, you know, very varied life experiences and, you know, a specific point of view that just needs to be heard. And quite frankly, a lot of the stuff, well, most of the stuff that we talk about is for us, by us and by us and for us. So, you know, like, at this, at the same time, you, we've got a lot of you know certainly white listeners and people that don't identify as black and whatnot that aren't part of the culture, but also appreciate you know the the, the platform that we have and the voices and the perspectives that we uniquely bring. And so, you know, I have to imagine that somebody that is that stepped into their purpose, whether they've realized a certain level of success within that purpose at this moment, can never truly understand and appreciate the impact that one can have on a multitude of individuals that you may never even know uh, just because you're creating that space and providing that voice um, that's uniquely your own. Yeah, and I just want to say shout out to y'all. Like, I do feel like the future is, because this is where, you know, I come out of the age where like black businesses, black owned business, like in the seventies and stuff like that, that was kind of ruined by, um, you know, um, the white machine. What do you call it? When the white people come into the neighborhood, what's why well, I know mm-hmm. I'm, gentrification. Um, gentrification. Gentrification. Yeah, gentrification. Mm-hmm. I know it was right on the edge of that. You know that, and but also like when I was so lucky that DC was really a um, sort of a base for a lot of black gay male thought, and I met Essex Hemphill very early, like I hadn't even been out for like six months or something like that, and I met him and spent a lot of time with him and everything like that, and I know that the base of all of the black gay critical thinkers then were like, we have to self publish our own books, we have to do, you know, just some way to control the output. So I just love what y'all are doing with the podcast and everything like that. Because I think that's the only way we're going to <laughs> consistently have a voice because really nobody cares, nobody else cares. It's, it's sad to word. say, but I just feel like that's the truth. You know, it is, it is it the is. truth. <laughs> we, and we know it and can't nobody tell us different until their mm-hmm. actions change. Consistently, habitually. Yeah, like that part. <laughs> yeah, because oh, anybody can be, anybody can put up a square or do something for, <laughs> you know, a month or two or whatever. But yeah, until I start seeing people get jobs with benefits, until I see mm-hmm. stuff like that, you know, um, yeah, we. I mean that, and that's you know, sort of if you think about it, like that's fundamental to the black experience in that we've always had to think that we were worth more than the society thought we were worth. You know, Mm -hmm. I mean, nobody would have ever gotten out of enslavement if they had not had that sense of worth and of perseverance in the face of people telling you that you're worthless. And, you Mm -hmm. know, 
to Harriet, me, that Harriet just, was sitting there one day like, bitch, I am fly. <laughs> 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 what? Saw a reflection in the water. Like, oh, huh. is, She said, <laughs> white refrigerator. Uh, 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 I fly. She <laughs> said, have you seen my calves? Have you seen my calves? Have you seen my trigger finger? <laughs> <laughs> my map reading skills. <laughs> Let me get out this bitch. Uh-uh. <laughs> this is not cute. What is it giving? Right. This is not giving anything. Let me get my brothers and sisters out of here. <laughs> um, quick question. What, what drew you to Luther? Like, why was that the, the autobiography you wanted to write? Um, that's kind of a, a Hmm. Well, okay. I mean, like I was, I grew up through the whole era of Luther. Like, I mean, I remember hearing his voice on commercials. You know, I had the Change album with Glow of Love and Searching. You remember the Sesame Street? Exactly. Like, so I was like, so it was kind of a continuum. But then when Never Too Much hit, it was like, damn, he's coming like that. So, yeah. you know, I experienced all of that. And my mom was a really big Luther fan, but Busybody was the first Luther album that. Cause you know, some my mom that wasn't necessarily buying stuff the day it came out or the first when it was. She's like, "Well, how many songs does it have?" Well, I haven't heard this on the radio yet. I didn't have time for all that because I was really in Luther at that point, really in the music. So I just wanted I went out and got the album myself. And like, you know, those moments that you look back on and you go, "Oh, I must have known that I was queer, that I was different <laughs> then because I related." Uh -huh. to, and you know, just so much about that album, like wanting love and just feeling like longer for somebody it's not there i mean it just because i think it, i was probably like 13 or 14 when it came out mm. so that sort of cemented my personal connection with luther and um you know and so then when i was at vibe this was when luther was doing that new album with clive davis the album with um take you out and stuff on it which and, was a bop which yes was oh a bop. please like <laughs> I, I first heard that y'all remember olivia i think she was on like love and hip-hop Mm -hmm. I was yes. at an Olivia because mm -hmm. she was also signed to J Records. So, and as part yeah. of my job at Vibe, I had to go. Wasn't she like one of the first ones signed to J Records? She was. By the way? And so they That's had this crazy. big party, this not a party, but a big. Li I would always be because my job was kind of to do new artists and to do the album review section. So I would always be going into. The, and at this time, print magazines had a lead time of like four or five months. So I would ha have to hear stuff that was wasn't even on the CD or wasn't even on. I would have to go to the studio to hear it. To decide, okay, is this good enough for the person <laughs> to be able to get a new artist profile? But anyway, so that but that's where at the tail end of that they were like, oh, Luther's coming out with a new song, and they played that, and I was just like, you so bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> so then, you know, I go close to go back and go like, oh, Luther's coming out. You know, I have to do this story. I have to do this story. So that's how I got the assignment, and okay. I went to um, interview him in Jamaica. And it was just, he was doing this Mother's Day concert and this whole thing. And we just, you know, kicked back and kikied. And he read me and I read him and I threw him a little shade. He threw me a whole shade tree, you know. But... <laughs> and who did he go home with? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really just like, you know, sitting there and just like, like an old, just the way I, conversations I used to have with like, a sort of older black gay uncle at the bar or something like that and just you know to tell him well why are you doing that but why are you doing that? and so we just had that energy so i really even though he did not come out to me or say anything like that it was just kind of like it was an understanding we that. are talking like we're talking yeah. come on. right we, we see like, each other <laughs> exactly we see each other so yeah. yeah and and so then fast forward to this is when i was in atlanta and i you know i'm I guess you can kind of see now that even though I don't really consider myself an ambitious person, but I'm a purposeful person. So I'm always kind of like, well, am I living up to my, you know, God given purpose at any given yeah. point? So at some point at the Atlanta Rural Constitution, I was like, well, I want to always want to write a book that'll elevate my game and everything like that. And so it was just a matter of conversations and none of, they didn't like any of my book ideas, whatever, whatever. Then Luther had his stroke. Right, and right. so I just had, happened to be talking to my agent, who was a white woman at the time, because most agents are white women, um, <laughs> which is a problem. Um, so anyway, so I just happened. She was like, oh, did you hear about Luther? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, you know, do you think anybody would be interested in a Luther book? And she's like, oh, my gosh, that's a great idea. Can you give you know, me a proposal by Monday or something like that? So I literally, I did not go out. 
I spent the whole weekend, and when I was a going out every single night person, but I spent the whole weekend just writing this Luther book proposal, and it's it sold and everything, and so it was just like great. It was like basically my advance was almost like a year's salary, so I was able to take time off of work to write. So I just thought I am living the dream. Like this is just <laughs> fantastic. Come to find out that. You know, and I'm thinking like it was the kind of thing that they thought that because obviously, you know, millions of black folks love Luther and all this kind of stuff. So my thinking was kind of like knowing that, that the white in publishing industry is not that into whatever us, but <laughs> that they thought, oh, well, you know, he had this ailment. And so this is a nice opportunity for us to acknowledge something that should be acknowledged. When I read all the rejections, it turned out that only one person made an offer on the book. And like all of these letters of people just going, I don't understand this man. I've never heard of him. I don't. Um, How you don't know Luther? <laughs> I'm talking about letters after letters with the insignia of like publishing <clears throat> brands that everybody say their name. Listening would know. <laughs> right, so I mean, I don't even have to say it because it's like Harper Collins was the one that offered me the deal. So if it wasn't Harper Collins, it was pitched to everybody else. It's everybody else. So, <laughs> but it's just really like. Oh, I, one person wrote something like, um, I had never heard of this person. And after reading the author's description of him, I'm even less interested. <laughs> so, Damn. you know, it's just one of those things that, but I'm glad I didn't know that when I was writing it. I'm glad I just did it with an earnest effort and right. put it out there. And that's what we have to do sometimes. We have to use these opportunities when we know that an organization institution is not a hundred percent committed to us but for whatever reason they feel like you know you're able to slip through and then you just have to do what you the best you can do you know but mm. it's just kind of it, a sad state of things you know it's it's interesting because um entertainment like reading music television plays whatever they're gatekeepers you know, you have to have an agent, you have to have a record deal, you have to have, and we're living in this age where creative content has been so democratized, you know, that it's accessible by anyone. And even for you, you know, you're, you've got your, you know, your, um, you're still writing and you've got your, your newsletter and you've got a bunch of things that, that you are the sole creator and publisher and, 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 and pusher of this perspective. How has, um, how is, sure. <laughs> I'm, no I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Maybe I should have said taker. Oh, no. <laughs> De depends on the day. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of jobs. That's not particularly one of them at the moment, but I just I don't want people to get the wrong idea. Be hitting me up. Well, he said you were a pusher. What's so uh, said? So <laughs> yeah, I heard you was a pusher. Why don't you push me sometime? <laughs> Said my DMs never been lit before. Right, like them DMs popping. <laughs> <laughs> so, how does it feel? I guess what I'm asking is, how does it feel to be to have a very strong perspective and very keen interest, particularly in you know black queer music from a genre standpoint? And that's a huge. That's a huge range. Even though some people might say that's very niche, it's not. It's huge. How does it feel? being in a position where you have the ability to to get your voice out there on you know un, unchecked unfettered unrestricted you know i mean it, it feels great and for two reasons i mean one just as a creative person like it's just the freedom of just being able to say stuff and not you know i would always like if i was pitching this publication i would have to think oh some old white lady's gonna read it so let me how am i gonna pitch it in such a way that they can understand it or whatever you know so like just not, and even even coming up when I came because I came up in the real hip hop era, and I love hip, you know. But I never people didn't want the black gay man to write about hip hop. People wanted the black gay man to write about the R and B stuff and all that kind of stuff, which was fine because that's also what I, you know, really really love. But just having the freedom of just doing saying whatever I want to say, that's great. And it's also really saved me creatively because the feedback that I'm able to just get from regular folks who are mm. always the most important audience to me, who are always the people that I care about most. Um, Cause you know, I grew up with a granddad who's like, well, your book learner don't matter. Like if you can't explain to the man on the street, like what, 
what are you going to school? Like, what's, what do you read all this stuff for? You have to right. be able to. So that's always, and I'm not saying, I know other people don't do that, but I'm just, and, and that's fine. I like, you know, intellectual academic work and all that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about what I do, you know? And he so said, for me, <laughs> right? for me personally, but <laughs> so just the feedback that I'm able to get from regular people in the moment really is the fuel that keeps me pushing on because it is very, if, if I had to do it by like what assignments I'm getting, what editors are calling, what, you know, and, and just seeing that, you know, you, I, I'm not, I always do feel like what's for me is for me. Like I'm very mm. much into that framework, but at the same time, like if you see people with less white people or just other people with less qualification, less this and that, being incorporated in spaces that could easily, you know, and you see that the people making these decisions are people that have complimented you or whatever, you know, and you just, if I had to judge my worth based upon what the industry is doing, I don't know that I would be, I couldn't even mm -hmm. probably get out of bed in the morning. I mean, what keeps me fueled is the feedback from the people. So that's another reason why just that direct audience without gatekeepers has been so great. Because when I was like writing for newspaper and stuff, I would only hear from people if they didn't like something. You know, <laughs> somebody would call me out there. No, I remember one no. time Tony Braxton's um, man, Barry Hankerson when he, was her manager at the time. Mm -hmm. He called me up and um, just gave me an earful. And I was just like, well, what? what, what? I'm, I can't read. I said what, what I said. I, what am I going to do? Unpublish the review? It was in the same right. Get paper. all of them back. So and, the ink is and it's in print. Like, what, I didn't like the it's album. It's in print. Yeah, I didn't like the album. What are you going to do? Like, it is what it, <laughs> Your tears so, yeah, ain't so. gonna wash them letters off the page. Which album was it? Which album was it? <laughs> it was more than a woman, and um, I liked yeah. hit the freeway mm -hmm. kind of, but I felt like hit the, the freeway. Yeah, I mean, but again, that sounded like like the song the Neptunes had just done for Faith. Like it was just it, everything seemed everything he seemed like she was just doing somebody else's type of song. She hopped on trends on that album. Exactly. Oh, wow. <laughs> and what he really didn't like, which, you know, I don't know, this might be in a bad taste or whatever, but I was like, and the album's so bad that she's even gone to, I don't know how worded, but grave robbing the title from Aaliyah. <laughs> Oh, my God. Oh, that's why Barry called you. That's why he really called you. That's the that's why. He said, keep my, my niece's name out, out your mouth. motherfucking mouth. <laughs> out your mouth, out your keyboard, out your, you know. But again, like, but I mean, I, I really did kind of feel like, why would you be calling, why would somebody, an established star like Tony Braxton in, like, what, 2021, right. 22, I mean, 20, oh, 2001, 2002, be calling your album the name of something that people had already identified so much with somebody else. Like, yeah. Like, are, what are recently. you trying to do? Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. she was like, oh, it's a tribute. I'm like, oh, child. You know, everybody oh, we can see. <laughs> we can see like, you. Uh, no we can see what that is. <laughs> like, just own it. But don't get mad at me. I entitled the album, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Like, we could literally, we're going, A, whether you like it or not, you got to come back because we have so many more questions that like we <laughs> want to dive fine. into because we I feel like, like I've these been talking too stories. much. I'm sorry, I'm just no. giving you these long winded mm -hmm. answers, but you the uh -huh. guest, you said the microphone is yours. <laughs> Period. The mic is on, <laughs> <laughs> and it needs to stay on. Um, but quickly, we're going to take a quick little tea break, and then we'll get into Ash Yanti's. <sighs> We interrupt this episode for very important information. That's right. You've been asking for it for a long time, and we have heard you. Yep, it's been a long time coming, but it's finally here. Yo, Yo aunties, aunties got, got merch. merch. Hey, <laughs> that's right. You know what? We got tees. We got long tees. We got sweatshirts. We got fanny packs. We got There's just a whole game of the stuff out there, so go and check that out. Mm. We are so appreciative of your love and support, and we are so excited to launch it. Girl, where can we find it at? Ma'am, they can head right over to minoritsreport.com to check out the selection. Mm. That's right. That's M-I-N-O-R-I-T-E-A, report.com. Woo, I'm about to go get me some myself.